I, I work in pulmonary <laughs> rehab at Lee Memorial Hospital. It's an outpatient program, uh, requires a referral from your doctor. It's for people with different types of lung conditions um, that have become deconditioned or hospitalized that need to um, be educated to help themselves learn more about their lung condition, how to manage it. And then we do exercise with it to help them get stronger. And really it's a program for the patient to help themselves in the future, just to, to learn about it so that they can, uh, they can benefit and, and uh, get on with their lives basically. It's a program, it's a multidisciplinary program, which means it has to be ordered by a physician. And we work with different groups in the hospital to do um, therapy, whether it's a nurse or physical therapist, occupational therapist, we are respiratory therapists that usually run the program. Um, and it's just kind of comprised of, of all of these people. Um, community speaker support groups, which of course, for the last couple of years, we haven't had too many support groups with COVID, but um, and we have a lot of our volunteers are our patients that we've had in the past that uh, have stayed and volunteered with us now. So to get into pulmonary rehab, there has to be a qualifying diagnosis. So um, there's, there's a myriad of diagnosis. Lung cancer isn't necessarily one of them, but an associated diagnosis of, of uh, COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, um, other disorders of the lung, cystic fibrosis, many of them. Um, would get them into the program uh, referred by their physician, their primary care or their pulmonary physician, anybody who is hands-on with the patient it, 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 it can follow them and uh, follow up with us for our, um, we have to do uh, care plan updates to the physician generally every 30 days just to keep them apprised of what the patient's doing. To get into the program, it requires a, a breathing test, a pulmonary function test, which probably most of you have had. Um, that's got a qualifying diagnosis and, and uh, function level on it. Insurance, of course, is, a, is an issue. If you have insurance, it's generally covered by Medicare and all of the Medicare replacements. And most of the private insurances cover it because it's, uh, they follow Medicare guidelines. Transportation has been an issue in the past um, because you have to go to a facility and there are really not that many pulmonary rehabs in the country located where people can actually get to them. So currently, because of the, the uh, hospital without walls, we've been able to provide pulmonary rehab by telehealth and telemedicine um, for certain diagnosis. So we've been doing that successfully for this past year. I'm hoping they're going to allow that to continue um, nationally. But at this point, we're waiting to see. So the, the objectives for pulmonary rehab, I guess our number one objective is just to improve the patient's quality of life. You know, um, help them have a, a better ability to cope with their illness, understand their illness, understand their limitations and, you know, exercise to their best of ability. So most people just are want to remain independent and stay at home and stay functioning. And that's our goal. Um, and primarily people are very seek us out first, probably because their biggest complaint is shortness of breath. So we teach them some breathing techniques and other things to help them reduce that, that breathing limitation for them so that they can, so they can function and get back to their hobbies or just actually to be able to perform their activities of daily living at home. Reduce, of course, the number of emergency visits and stuff, which is every, on everyone's, you know, COPD lung problems are one of the leading causes of admissions to hospitals. And so we're always trying to manage that as best we can. Um, and then basically to restore the patient to their highest level of functional capacity. So there's, there's a lot of different diagnoses. Of course, these are just a few of them. COPD, which is an all encompassing term, which is emphysema, chronic bronchitis, any limited airflow type of lung disease, um, asthma, pulmonary fibrosis and bronchiectasis. Some of those pre and post lung surgery, a lot of people um, and transplants. We do a lot of transplant post pre and post transplant patients um, waiting for a lung transplant. And then, you know, all the restrictive disorders, there's, there's a lot of different ways to get in. Uh, and there's a list of diagnoses that qualify that we help patients figure out what's best for them. So basically the physician makes a referral uh, once they've seen the patient and we continue communication with the referring physician throughout the program. So once the patient comes in and we assess them, we come up with a, a, a physical plan for them, something, an education plan, and then a physical exercise plan their doctor and our medical director have to approve that. And then we set goals and they work towards those goals 
Every 30 days, we update that um, until the patient has gotten most of the information and feels like they can continue on their own. Most of the programs are between five and nine weeks, um, two days a week for a couple of hours a day. And it's the quality um, improvement, the outcomes are pretty high. Most, I've been doing this for 40 years almost, and most people that try to benefit from this really do. And we have a maintenance program after they finish that they can stay in and just continue the exercise if they want to. A lot of people, especially if they're on oxygen or uh, need a walker or something, aren't really very comfortable in a regular gym. So we have a place at the hospital um, where they can continue to exercise there. So this is all the education things we try and touch base on with each person. It's a, it's a general overview for most people. Everybody has different symptoms. So some things are going to mean more to some people than they will to others. So the anatomy of the respiratory system, just so you understand how the lungs work. Um, we teach particular breathing techniques, which some of you may have learned just from your, your trials with your lung cancer and it being in the hospital or with a, a therapist is that, um, uh, Perslip breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, those are all good techniques to help with somebody who has limited airflow um, to manage their energy conservation and especially anxiety and stress. Uh, it's, a, it's hard to have a chronic disease and not know what's going to happen with it. So developing a plan to take care of that is really important. Infection control for us is key because uh, a lot of patients, especially on home therapy and stuff, tend to reinfect themselves with their own equipment. So we're really heavy on infection control and nutrition. Um, medications, you know, depending on what they are, uh, oxygen, if you have it, if you require it, uh, we monitor to see if you need it um, and what we need to do about it. Um, falls prevention, smoking cessation, it's just kind of anything that would pertain to promoting better lung health. Emotional support, and I guess for anybody with a chronic lung disease or any disease, it's kind of important to, you know, know what you recognize, what your symptoms are and know what your limitations are learn to adapt your lifestyle to change them so that, you know, you're not frustrated with where you are, include the people we try and include families in that so that their relationships and their, their family members understand the condition that they have and how they can best support them as well. And a lot of times caregivers really don't have a lot of support themselves. So we try and help the caregivers get support as well as the patient. Um, and basically for those diagnoses, COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, hypertension, those are all support groups that are available online or in person in some areas. So the, the basic things about respiratory disease is that it really affects the peripheral muscle function. It's a deconditioning of the upper and lower extremities. Um, there's respiratory insufficiency, loss of lung function, whether it's from surgery or from just damage, um, deconditioning of the diaphragm or impairment of the diaphragm. Sometimes the diaphragm is damaged from surgery. Um, and that's one of the main muscles that helps you with breathing. So uh, we try and do breathing exercises for those people so that they can improve that function. And it's really important nutrition, big deal, because low or high body mass index being underweight is, is difficult because the patient's always chronically fatigued and um, just doesn't have a lot of stamina. So they're very, they're very prone to further infections and stuff. And overweight just puts an added burden on the, on the body um, and causes other conditions such as sleep apnea and obstruction of the breathing, which makes it difficult for them to breathe in general. Cardiac impairments and stuff, of course, there are a lot of people that have, most lung patients don't have just lung issues. Um, they have some cardiac impairment as well. Heart and lungs work so closely together that it's really difficult to tell sometimes if it's a heart issue, a lung issue, or after a long period of time, it's generally a combination of both. So we monitor all those parameters in class to see blood pressure and the heart rhythm um, while they're exercising so we can um, let the doctors know if we see any issues. You know, people can have osteoporosis, arthritis, you know, psychosocial issues like, um, anxiety and depression all make it a little bit harder for a patient to manage, you know, their condition themselves. So, so this is, it's not just a cycle of breathing, but it's a cycle of deconditioning. Cause if you think about it, when you don't feel well, you, you avoid the activities, especially if it makes you short of breath, you're going to avoid the activities that cause you to be short of breath. So the less activity you do, the less you're able to do muscles become weaker. Your breathing becomes more inefficient. You get more short of breath and it just forms this vicious cycle. That's really difficult to break. And that's what we're looking to do is just kind of interrupt that cycle, teach them how to manage it, slow down, use breathing techniques, 
make their muscles stronger. It's, it's not rocket science. It's just, we put A before B, B before C um, to let them manage themselves better in an, in an easy way. So types of components, you know, we have, if you're coming to the inpatient program, we have walking in a track, we have treadmill cycles, up and lower body um, ergometers. Uh, we do weight training and uh, we do muscle training, inspiratory and expiratory muscle training is actually a, a little device that we give the patients that helps um, strengthen the diaphragm muscle and just the, the significant muscles of breathing. Um, and we do monitoring on the cardiac rhythm, of course, blood pressure, oximetry, um, and scales of shortness of breath, pain scale, all of those things are considered when we're, we're doing a program. These are kind of the scales that we use. And we just like for people to keep in mind when you get short of breath, we want you to know why. And if your certain activities cause you to be short of breath, the Borg scale of exertion is how fatigued do you get doing a certain activity? So if you can kind of keep in mind rating that on a zero to 10 scale and breathlessness, dyspnea, a complicated word for breathlessness, um, just so that your activities are kind of based on this, you know, lower your expectations and the activities that are hard for you and then increase them when they're not. So the whole goal, we're trying to improve the, the effectiveness of your breathing, reverse the muscle deconditioning, increase your exercise tolerance and stamina, um, make sure that you get a consistent exercise routine that you can stick with something that you can stick with and grow because it's not just for the program. It's for the rest of your life. And it's not just for people that have lung problems or cardiac problems. It's for everybody. We all need to be doing these things and it doesn't really matter where you start or when you start. It's just to start slow and build up slowly and maintain it, but it definitely improves confidence. People be, feel very in confident or unconfident when they can't breathe and they can't manage to get their housework done or they can't manage to do shopping or bathing and stuff for themselves, you know, it erodes the confidence and it really increases anxiety. So it's important to, to bring them back to a level where they feel like they can manage for themselves, um, increases their independence. We keep up with that. And, and also the program, it's ongoing because it reduces isolation, which has been a problem with COVID. You know, a lot of people have felt, especially if they have an illness, the need to stay away out of groups because they don't want to get anything that's going to make them worse. So isolation is a big deal when you don't feel like you can manage to get out of your house to go anywhere. It, it's difficult. So it's good to socialize and be around people with things that with the same conditions you do so you understand and have someone to share that with. For us in the hospital, phase one is if the, pay, the physicians ask us to see them while they're in the hospital. Phase two is the, the monitor classes that we do on an outpatient basis once they've been discharged or are referred by their doctors. And it's a, there's different times and days that we do it. And now uh, we weren't able to do this before, but now we can actually offer the telehealth program. So some people can't you know, they can't walk into the hospital. They can't walk that far. They don't have transportation. They're back and forth out of town up north. So we can do the telehealth sessions uh, for certain uh, criteria. And then there's a maintenance program that's two to three days a week if they want to, where they can just continue their exercise, as we said before, um, just to keep their, their strength up. And we have, they have us to monitor them if they feel like something's going on that they're not aware of. Actually here, there's a, there's a program at Lee Memorial and there's a program at Cape Coral Hospital. Um, there's also programs in Naples and Port Charlotte. So uh, I think we're the only ones that are doing telehealth right now. But hopefully in the future, that'll be available to everybody. Okay, insurance. Medicare, uh, Medicare covers 80% as they do for everything outpatient. Most of the private insurances and med Medicare replacements do cover it. Some people have a copay or a um, out-of-pocket that needs to be met. Um, we do check that before they come in. So they'll know what they have issue. It's not going to be a surprise for them. It's a pathway, you know, it's a pathway between inactivity and activity, isolation and socialization, depression, hope. And from the beginning, you know, to an observer of life, to being back to being an active participant, which is our goal, just to get you back to the things that you want to do and how much of it you want to do. And I like this. My final thoughts are what fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day. So, and then the last one is now, this is your doctor. Seriously, what can we do to improve our health? Okay. He keeps saying exercise, exercise, exercise. Please listen to your doctor. Exercise.